So welcome to the third and final session of this series on editing and encoding in the undergraduate classroom, jointly hosted by SUNY Geneseo, the New York Digital Humanities Group, and Digital Thoro, and supported with a grant from SUNY's Innovative Instruction Technology Program. In the first session two weeks ago, we heard a presentation on theorizing and implementing digital editions from Professor David Birnbaum at the University of Pittsburgh. In the second, last week, a group of us working with the newly digitized manuscript of Henry David Thoreau's Walden described how the manuscript can be used to teach digital scholarly editing to undergraduates. And tonight we're going to hear about projects that members of our digital humanities community are working on. We will hear first from Lisa Hermson, Professor of English, College of Liberal Arts, Rochester Institute of Technology. Then Helen R. Davies, Assistant Professor of Digital Humanities, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Laura Johnson, Research Assistant and Primary Source Cooperative at Northeastern University. Alisa Bashero Bondar, Penn State Erie, the Barron College. Serenity Sutherland, Assistant Professor of Communication Studies, SUNY Oswego and Robin Sullivan, Teaching and Learning Strategist, University Libraries, University at Buffalo. So our first presenter again, Lisa Hermson, RIT. Um, she's going to talk about her work in collaboration with her colleague, Rebecca Walker, Digital Humanities and Social Sciences Librarian at RIT, transcribing and encoding original records from William Townsend and Sons, printers and account book manufacturers. First of all, I mean, thank you for having us um, and for putting this on and um, apologies for not making it last week. I actually did watch one of the town halls, um, but I did um, want, I hope that some of the stuff that I talk about echoes a little bit of the keynote. Um, my partner, Rebecca Walker, is a digital his, um, humanities librarian at RIT Libraries, and we're really hoping that that some kind of encoding collaboration can happen um, here locally. We've um, been uh, talking to Sarah Connell as a consultant. She's with the Women's Writers Project and she's been invaluable to us so far, um, but the money will run out and that consultant um, <laughs> will not be available forever. So I'm hoping we have a, a group here. Our students, um, I, it's an odd ever since because of the pandemic we have we don't have a classroom anymore and what we have are dhss students who um, are undergraduate researchers in need of a capstone in need of an internship or need of a co-op and they've been with us um, for since march but we've had um, jay long who's sort of taken um, a leadership role in the um, project has been with us for the full 18 months that we've been on this project. Um, William Townsend and Sons was a, a job printer um, in, in the UK 1850 to approximately 1910, fuzzy years. Um, and they were account book manufacturers as well as book binders and job printers and et cetera. The interesting thing about this is that they were account book manufacturers, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, oh dear, now we have a problem. We should have tried this. Okay, got it. Um, so this is a manuscript that we are working with, and you can see that it's actually very pretty handwriting. <laughs> um, and there are, there are five volumes of these. So this is the what we're calling volume one, a business guide and works manual. Um, there are other four others. Um, this one is 400 pages. So um, all of these, except for um, I think the private trade ledger, you know, the library catalog has been um, scanned. So um, trying to figure out like what will happen across all five of these is, 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 is a little bit fuzzy yet. So we started with, with volume one. Um, and you can see there it is lovely, the secret of account, making account books. <laughs> um, the scholarly interest in this, um, so why bother? Um, the fact that they were account book manufacturers means they were stationary and vellum binders. So there are, you know, printers and letterpress printers and et cetera. And then there's this other graph, 
group of people who are job printers, but then another group of people who are bookbinders, and then another group of people who are not artistic bookbinders, but were bookbinders for professions like accounting. So it's really this sort of niche group of printing. And um, there's, to our knowledge, after we've done a, quite a bit of, of searching and talking to people in the UK and elsewhere, um, probably one of the few, if only um, collection that's coming straight out of a print shop. So this is the manager, this is the master shop person writing um, this business manual. So part of it is rarity. The other things have to do with material culture, accounting and capital and capitalism, visual culture of accounting, religion and accounting. And you get all these cute little sayings about how they had to tug really hard to get the binding out. And so that's, um, it's kind of interesting just to, just to go through for, for fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> looking at the at the right, you will see that the fancy handwriting does not stay fancy handwriting and it becomes really ugly very, very quickly. At that point, um, we realized that there was really no way we were going to um, do any kind of diplomatic transcription. There was no way even TEI's light was going to handle it. Um, and, and we even came to TEI as a, as a last resort. <laughs> we thought, what could, you know, do we, do we really have to go that route? Because we didn't know anything about it. Um, but the more we looked at it, the more, the more we decided, you know what, there's, there's stuff that TEI is gonna tell us that anything else would not tell us. Um, so we, we're using TEI all, we have a customized schema with the ODD, we have an, we're using Oxygen with GitHub, we have an internal encoding document that's a draft that is always a draft. <laughs> um, we just started a database um, full of people and terms because we realized we're going to want and need that. Um, so that's kind of the, the work we've done over 18 months. Um, I know that, that we talked about the philosophy and logic of the text. You guys did the, the first session. Um, that is one of th the first things that Sarah said to us was, what is your philosophy of the text? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> A philosophy of the text, I don't have one. Um, so we got one pretty quickly. Um, she, she, she sort of was kept asking, well, is it meaningful? And it was, it was really hard for the first few months to understand what meaningful meant. I don't know, you know, we didn't know what was meaningful. We did know we had no logic of the text. There's no divisions. So you would think it would be dates because you can see here there are dates, but you'll notice one is 91 and one is 93. And I can assure you that stuff happened between those two dates. So there, it, it's not organized by dates. It doesn't seem to be organized by theme. We have an index, but the index doesn't match up to the number of pages, so it's not, it doesn't work. So we had to come up, we like made up divisions. <laughs> we don't have paragraphs. So we also made, we went with ABs instead of paragraphs. Um, so there are all kinds of, of things that get very messy very clearly. Um, we don't know whether something is, a, is an apparent error or whether something you know, is, is handwriting. Um, what was interesting is that our students started to get bugged by this stuff fairly quickly. And it was really interesting to see them at, sort of attack these problems. Our um, IED, our, our document is actually co-authored. Our students worked as much and put as much text into that as we did. And so this has been a, a really collaborative project. Um, so you can see sort of, a, you know, who's working on who because that's the problem that bugged them. <laughs> um, the really, the point at which we, we realized that we were in trouble <laughs> um, was when we started trying to encode for numbers, measurements, formula, and tables. So you'll see there, there are sizes of books, which you, so you, so book might be the commodity. And then you have um, the FCAP um, paper, quarto, 45 sheets, and, I, and, and it goes on, and then it equals whatever that number is with all those fractions. <laughs> so when we try to turn that into anything, um, other than, you know, that's where it's like, okay, diplomatic maybe would have worked here, but it's not. But if we want to know what it's measuring and if we want to know what the size of accounting books actually are, we actually have to turn that formula into something. Um, and that is where at that point we, you know, we had a, a student who is um, working with, uh, came to us from computer science into digital humanities, was like gung ho and sure that he was going to help us with that. Um, and it was, it, it, it just got, it got really tough. And so the, the question was, does this matter for us right now? It may matter for a 
um, book historian down the road, um, but maybe we can maybe we can push it down the road a little bit. And so that's when we sort of said, okay, hands up, help. Maybe TEI can't even do this. Maybe TEI all is not going to work for this. Um, Catherine Tomasek is working on a project for encoding historical financial records and specifically looking at transactions. So you can do equal, for example. Um, and so we tapped on, on her door and she's been willing to work with us a little bit. But that's where I think trying to figure out Okay, so we've maybe we've pushed the boundaries of, of, of what we can do with this and, and what's, you know, what's our option. Um, so I guess I'll say that as far as students in an, in an undergraduate classroom, um, the classroom was, you know, online. <laughs> um, so we, um, you know, talking to, to students about, about TEI as well as the, the research questions, I think was really, interesting because um, I think you'll see you'll see it at this interesting merge um, in which our students were able to sort of say the TI was really interesting but so was the decision making or so was the research I did on Townsend so there is a sort of um, mesh that we were able to get from them and I will say that since we talked to them um, Jay who is sort of leading the project they've been um, doing tons of research just in order to transcribe. So Rhone de la Rue, um, they've been looking up Rhone de la Rue <laughs> for two days now. Um, and I've let them go ahead and do that. Um, it, you know. So anyway, it's, um, I think it's been, an, uh, the, it's been a way to, TEI and the encoding has been a way to understand the manuscript better than we ever could have understood the manuscript. It, understand, it allows us to understand what is meaningful, what the philosophy of the text is. It allows us to try to understand the logic, um, which you know plays into to, well, what's going on here? Who's writing? What's writing? What are they writing for? What, what's going on? Um, and then it's really allowed us to work very closely with students. All of, all of them are paid, by the way. Um, it says paid interps, paid co-ops. Um, the capstone's not, but for credit. Um, so it's, it's actually sort of allowed students to understand how this, this text encoding um, manages to um, allow humanists to do something with a manuscript like this from the 19th century um, now and why that would matter and who it matters for. So uh, next up, we have Helen R. Davies, um, who is uh, at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And Helen's going to talk about her experience teaching TEI over Zoom to students who did not know what the digital humanities were before the semester and had never even heard of it. Hi, sorry, I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. I had too many windows open. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, the TEI in a new undergraduate curriculum. So I am a new professor at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. I was up at the University of Rochester before. And they've hired me partly to start a new digital humanities curriculum down here. Um, and so I am working to do that but this is the kind of uh, digital humanities that I normally do. I work traditionally on uh, multispectral imaging. So TEI is a radically different departure for me. Um, it was part of my master's degree and it was part of my training at, um, at the University of Rochester as well as at Loyola University of Chicago where I studied the digital humanities. Um, however, it is a different ballgame for me. And so, and so as part of my work at, the U of, um, at UCCS, I am working to create this new digital humanities curriculum from scratch. Um, and so part of that, as far as I understand it, has to focus on the, um, on the development of the digital humanities as, as connected to text, especially as I am part of the English department. And so I would like to keep them happy. And uh, so, and additionally, obviously, um, I feel like the digital humanities at least partly evolved out of the work of Roberto Busa and his punch cards and all of that sort of text encoding. And so I feel it's an important part um, to get students used to at any kind of entry level digital humanities course. 
So the way in which I have conceived this class is sort of as a survey of the digital humanities in which it's broken down into um, a unit on TI, a unit on digitization, a unit on uh, data visualization, and a unit on mapping, because I like maps. And- uh, Can I uh, interrupt for just a second? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if, if others are seeing your screen because- No, I can't see your screen. I just- oh. saw yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right, okay, so let's try this again. Here's, can you guys see it this time? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for letting me know. Okay, so um, I'll start over again. Here is the um, little video of showing what I mean when I say I normally do multispectral imaging. Uh -huh. This is the type, <laughs> helpful. Um, this is the type of digital humanities work I normally do that is um, working with text uh, digitally with computer assisted technologies, but is radically um, not about encoding. The kind of tr stuff that I do for my own research is about textual recovery. And so um, I have, as I was saying, been trained in TEI, but it's not something that I do regularly. And so I was trying to build a curriculum that, um, especially for this first introductory class, that touched on all of the important points of, um, of the digital humanities, including good old Roberto Busta and his punch cards, which hopefully you guys can now see a lovely image of. Um, and so this um, this is his uh, little Thomas Aquinas uh, concordance that he was working on back in the very early days of computers reading text. And because, um, as far as I understand it, the digital humanities is inherently connected to this long tradition of textual editing and uh, critical editing, especially for a computer, then um, I think it's really important for my students to get there. However, the first time they saw something that looked like this, they freaked out. They were not terribly impressed. And this is just, I'm fairly certain, stolen from Wikipedia. So this is not any kind of fancy TEI that I've done. Um, but so I worked with my students to try to get them comfortable because I thought it was really important for them to start to think about text in this new way. And as the last presenter was kind of saying, uh, if you're working with TI, it forces the students to do basically a close reading in a brand new light. And so as they start to think about the translation of um, a physical object into a digital object, they run into a heck of a lot of hurdles um, when they're trying to do this. And so as part of this course, we work together to download Oxygen uh, because I perhaps foolishly thought it was the easiest program for the students to use for a TEI and you can get a 30 day free trial as a student. So I went ahead and did that. Um, and we talked about what the TEI header meant and the TEI, uh, the various paratextual apparatus, the various uh, extra bits in this. And they really started to think about what the difference between the digital object was and the physical object. Um, however, they were not terribly impressed with me. And so one student uh, flat out said, I thought this was an English class. I thought we were reading books. Why are we doing this? And I then had to walk them through, well, we are reading books. This is just a brand new type of theory. And so um, there, were good, there were good things that came out of this. For instance, um, my students, one student encoded a, um, a family tree, which was a very interesting move. Uh, several other students did more traditional things, but they really came together to work as a class to figure out how to do this. And now this was particularly important because obviously it's 2020, I'm teaching over Zoom. And so we are really struggling to navigate how to build a class dynamic. And so as much as they were unimpressed with um, the idea of viewing a text as something that could be encoded, they also, um, they also really, I think, came together as a class to kind of puzzle through these things. And the other thing, as the last presenter was saying, is that they really interacted with the text in a new way. So I'm in an English department, um, but as I'm a medievalist, I thought I'm not gonna also inflict medieval literature on them, as well as inflicting all these, these new digital technologies. Though today I did make them look at Beowulf. Um, and so, 
I let them choose their own text. And the thing that really stood out to me is that several students um, worked through what was clearly their favorite text. Like some of them definitely chose texts that were like their favorite from school. Like I had one student who worked with Paradise Lost and this is clearly not your bedtime reading that you do for fun. But I had another student, I had several students who chose their favorite, um, their favorite novels from their favorite series and they really worked through them in a new way. Like one student worked with Crazy Rich Asians and another student, several students worked with Harry Potter and they figured out how to encode um, figures and they figured out how to encode, encode like the big fancy letters at the beginning of it. And so it became a really effective tool for them to, um, to analyze some of the texts that they took for granted in a totally new way. One student um, was working with, uh, goodness, what is it called? Um, with a text from the 1800s, one of the early mystery novels. And she got really into the slang that was used because she was trying to figure out how to encode exclamations. And so she really then went down a um, sidetrack or a rabbit hole of, uh, of figuring out how um, like kind of swear words have evolved over time. And so by having them do a small paper in addition to the encoding project, they kind of uh, were forced to do a new form of close reading that actually worked really well. And the lab format of this class meant that they had to be actively engaged. Whereas I'm sure many of you have also tried to do a um, Zoom discussion, a seminar style discussion over Zoom. It's a, it's a tough call, it's a tough day to do sometimes. But by having them have a lab that they were forced to interact with their classmates and they were forced to be actively engaged with software and with um, a project at hand, they really started to, um, there wasn't a sense of the fact that they might be playing Animal Crossing in the background or something, which has happened in a previous class. And so um, this felt like a way that not only were students um, getting a new way of reading out of it, but they were actively engaged at the same time, which in 2020, I think is a minor miracle. However, I've run into a thing that actually I would love to talk to you guys about as a whole, um, is that my students who, again, this is the first digital humanities class they've had, have actually gone a little bit far in learning how to copy from models and have sort of moved into full on plagiarism. Uh, well, no, not full on plagiarism, but have moved into kind of a gray area. And so um, one of the things I was hoping that we could talk about in discussion is how you handle things like saying that you can use TI by example, you can use any YouTube models that you found because apparently there's YouTubers now that talk about TI, which was a revelation for me. Um, but then there seemed to be students who then took that a step further. And instead of just looking at for instructions online, also looked at models and so this is a little snippet from the Walt Whitman archive. And I chose this because as some of my students who apparently are into Walt Whitman, um, and which I guess is fine. And, um, but they also, they started including tags that I knew I hadn't taught them. So they were looking for online models and building in on things that they thought looked important. And so I don't kind of have a brilliant closing argument here other than the fact that TI, teaching TI online and teaching TI on Zoom can be really engaging, can force students to think about text in a new way. And especially as I've started a new digital humanities class was a great and important first step for them to start to think about text as data instead of just text as something they read and interpreted. Um, yet, I just wanna end on a cautious note that there is with teaching TEI online, there is a line in which it's hard to um, navigate that space between modeling and copying. That's all, thank you so much. So the, um, the next presenter we're going to hear from is Laura Johnson uh, at Northeastern University. Laura. All right, um, hi everyone. I'm just gonna make sure I have the right screen that I'm sharing. All right. Um, so, uh, hi, I'm a PhD student um, from Northeastern University. I'm in the English department. Um, and today I'm going to be ta talking about something. Uh, I'm not necessarily a professor, right, because I'm hopefully a professor in training. Um, but uh, I'm going to be talking about um, still a text encoding module that I had um, a privilege of working with Sarah Connell um, to develop uh, this past spring. Um, and 
So if you are interested in these slides, I have a link uh, down there. So first, um, at Northeastern in the Digital Humanities Center, the new lab, uh, we have an initiative called the Digital Integration Teaching Initiative, uh, which is essentially a program where grad students under the supervision of faculty collaborate with different faculty in order to introduce different digital skills and methods um, into courses. And so this is working in the style of creating partnerships where uh, graduate students and faculty are developing materials for their curriculum and presentations in collaboration for their existing courses and really geared not just in you know, coming in, doing presentations and then leaving, but coming in, teaching the faculty skills um, so that they can either you know, continue to work with DITI or have the knowledge to incorporate these in their future uh, courses. So thus the goals of DITI are twofold, both to integrate digital skills to enhance existing course learning outcomes and goals, um, but then also teach both students and faculties faculty members skills that can be used in their own future work and courses. So this past spring, and this happened in January and February before um, we went online here at Northeastern, uh, we worked with Professor Nicole Algio um, in her 18th century British literature course uh, to create a module for three different class sessions on an introduction to uh, TI or encoding. So here's a brief description of what this was going to be about. Um, so the first session with the class, uh, we had a short introduction to TI workshop, not you know, very expansive, but very much geared towards what we were gonna be doing uh, for this particular module, um, in which the outcome that we wanted to have was that students were gonna be working in pairs to encode short passages of about two to three paragraphs of Orinoco by Afra Ben, which is the text that uh, Professor Aljo had decided to work around for this particular project. So once we had introduced TI and got the students kind of a little bit um, familiar with the processes, uh, we were going to have them do a little bit of that work outside of class and then come together in the next course to have a discussion about different ways of reading the text. Um, I think we've already had some really wonderful presentations about how uh, TI can be a way to um, have different um, interactions with text. And so what we were going to be doing is using uh, interp tags to do kind of thematic encoding in which the class together was going to be generating a list of different themes that they wanted to mark. Uh, and then together we would have that list created. Um, so the really cool thing about this module is that um, one of the digital scholarship uh, group team members here at Northeastern used a set citation, if I pronounced that correctly, um, but uh, had created all of the XSLT and CSS and JavaScript needed to automatically um, transform the XML document the students were working with into an HTML version so that they could see the um, color, uh, the color encoding uh, passages that they had done. So um, once we had the students encode it, we also had them present on their different passages, both for what are the different ways uh, that they were reading it, what were the things that they marked, and what was kind of uh, the things that were really salient of that list of themes that we had come up with as a class um, and how could they see that. So I wanted to briefly, um, I added these images just really quickly, so I apologize if they're, um, I don't want to handle, you know, three different um, windows. But when we created the materials for this, um, this project, uh, we had um, example encoding that we had already done. So this is just a brief sample. Um, and in this um, encoding uh, excerpt that I had done of Orinoco, I had used uh, the interp um, tags to mark emotion and perception in this passage. And then using the Anna attribute with the SAG uh, tag to be able to do um, pointers with the XML ID. So that's the um, system that we were kind of using in order to kind of, you know, in a basic way, be able to encode different interpretations. So this is briefly a screenshot 
um, of the list of all the different themes that the students had put together. Um, we had talked about, um, we also included in the presentation materials um, or for the class, we had a template so they wouldn't have to, you know, start an entire XML document themselves, but just kind of get started with encoding. Um, and then we had, uh, we made this so they could, they could just copy and paste it into their documents and, and have it all come up. But it's really interesting things that they, you know, noticed as they were transcribing. Um, wanting to mark, you know, difference between the slave names and free names, um, language uh, related to colonialism, um, embodiment, um, hypocrisy, heteronormativity. Um, so there was a lot of really cool things. And I'm briefly just going to switch screens here because um, I wanted to show what the output of this looks like. So this is the HTML um, version of the sample encoding uh, that I had done, where we have here um, emotions in purple and the uh, perception languages in red. But if I can go over to this one, this is the list of all the, the, um, the themes they had done uh, with the different uh, colors that we had um, attributed to them with CSS. Um, so it's really wonderful because we had this already structured so that all the students had to do um, was, you know, have these wonderful discussions in class. Uh, and really, we were able to have some really wonderful discussions about, you know, what does it mean to um, read a text? What does it mean to be working with a text digitally? What does it mean to transcribe a text? Um, and also thinking about how different digital skills uh, interplay with that. So I wanted to kind of just provide a bit of a brief overview of what that module was. Um, but here's a little bit of more information. Um, Ash Clark, who did all of the stuff um, for the uh, integration of certitian um, into the classroom, has a repository on GitHub if people are interested. Uh, more kind of documentation will be coming. Um, I also have included some information to the digital teaching Digital Integration Teaching Initiative. Um, and we've done this uh, module in other classes, which I have a link um, here too as well. Um, so welcome to have any questions about it, um, but it's been really cool to um, be on the side of both as a student, um, but as a PhD student who's you know, looking forward to teaching and definitely wanting to incorporate um, uh, encoding into the classroom as uh, encoding is a lot of the work that I do. So thanks for letting me talk about this. Thank you, Laura. That was, that was great. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Alisa Bashero bondar um, whose full title I neglected to read earlier. She is Program Chair of Digital Media Arts and Technology, Professor of Digital Humanities, and Director of the Digital Humanities Lab at Penn State Erie the Behrend College. And um, her talk is on um, going from XML Crowdsource to crowdsourcing to TEI, one way into teaching the TEI for manuscripts. Hey. Hi, okay, so I'm gonna try to do this really, really fast. Um, like some of you, I am coming into to starting a new digital humanities program. Um, unlike some of you, I have been teaching since the 90s and I am I'm at a full professor rank and I used to be an English professor. Um, I have switched gears and text encoding is kind of my life. Um, I am also an elected member of the TEI Technical Council, so I know a whole lot more about the TEI than probably people have a right to know at this point. Um, but my one of the main classes I'm developing in my first year as program chair at Penn State Erie is a class in text encoding and the TEI is front and center. Um, now, I come at teaching the TEI from teaching XML um, primarily, and my students, I tend to prioritize them writing their own XML and making up their own tag names as they encounter texts. Um, so I will start a class by maybe giving them a small recipe to ask them to figure out how to model that in XML of their own devising. When I get to TEI, I slow down because it's a slow process of having them read and look up and learn things from the guidelines. And I'm never happy with how I do it. This fall, I've tried something different and it's a pedagogical experiment. Here we go. So 
I wanted to show people how the TEI is something we use in communities and it involves having a controlled vocabulary instead of something that we make up for oneself, uh, for ourselves. Um, for the first three or four weeks of the course, my students had been writing their own XML, making up tag names, and also writing their own schema rules to control, to say, I'm gonna set the rules for my own project. They had learned that before I gave them an encounter with the TEI. And I thought, well, if I'm going to teach them about working with a community, let's show them how some public projects are working with crowdsourcing, um, because that is going to require sharing a kind of controlled vocabulary. When people are doing transcription, um, they're going to need to learn how to do the transcription of strange markup. markup. Um, I gave them this little exercise just to start out, and this was my lead in. Um, do a little bit of transcription for about three hours because I didn't want them to die of this. Um, reading handwriting is difficult for them, as many of them commented. Um, do some reflection. I sent them into the Smithsonian and had them do just choose something that was unfinished in from one of their public crowdsourcing projects. And you can see how, look at this crossed out thing here, um, you can see how there's guidance. There's a set of instructions that tells you how to deal with things that are deleted on a page. And I ask students to do that, work within the system, see what it's like. Here are some of their comments on that experience. Um, and they worried about things like how did this, how did the people in charge of the operation figure out how to reconcile misspellings that we transcribers do? I love this last comment. Um, I think the website explains like uh, who does this stuff? Are they Smithsonian employees? I think the website explains this briefly, but something to humanize these mysterious editing overlords would be nice. And they would they he was like, I'd love to watch a live stream of people figuring out how to deal with crowdsourcing on the other side. So fun times. That was my precursor to having them work on a real project. Um, I'm, uh, I moved from Pitt to Penn State and in my new role here, I was finding out what digital projects were going on across the Penn State system. This is a very important one going on as a collaboration with the digital Howard, with, with Howard University. Um, Anna Julia Cooper, I've come to learn, it was an amazing woman, black woman activist of the 1930s. Her work was recently digitized by my colleague, Shirley Moody Turner, who's at the University Park campus of Penn State. And and I basically asked her, uh, it, they, that her work had been, they had digitized photos of her, um, it, what, what, what they had prepared were digital facsimiles of her manuscripts. Um, and they had gone through a phase of crowdsourcing. So last summer, I was always preparing the course. I met, I, I found my way to meeting Shirley and I asked her, do you need help with reviewing transcriptions? I've got a text encoding class, want us to try some TEI for you. And um, she basically said, have at it, do what you want. Um, your students can build projects if they want to. And I went through and selected what I thought was a really cool text. Um, I'll have well, links to these slides. I'm not gonna link out to this, but she had responded to a survey of um, black college graduates in 1930 at a point when she was actually kind of a inst an academic institutional. She was the president of a college herself in DC. The survey asked for her racial philosophy and her handwriting on this thing overflows the boundaries of the survey form in pretty amazing ways. She goes over on the back. Um, they gave her four lines. She kept on going. And because it was about her reflecting on her college education, I thought college students are going to be super interested in this. This is a document data modeling challenge. Um, it had been, this is what uh, Shirley also sent me the results of crowdsourcing on this document. And I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but this is what crowdsourcing comes in looking like. And to my horror, I don't know how they're going to reconcile this. You can see that they've been um, collecting words on the page, but they've also been the stuff that's from the form is separated out down at the bottom. And I'm thinking, wait a second, don't we need a way of binding the questions to the responses? Isn't that something markup could give us? 
Yeah, exactly. So here we go. Um, we moved from that into the TEI to say, all right, with the TEI, how does the TEI handle document data modeling? How is it different? And I gave the students a starting point to say, go into the guidelines. I gave them about five or six, uh, three or four different chapters in the guidelines to review and gave them some leads and gave them a TEI template, but said, how can we find a way using the TEI to connect the survey prompts with her handwritten responses. I had a class of 25 students. They were all over the place with this, um, but several of them found their way to some pretty wise ideas. Um, they found their way to the hand desk and the type desk. They didn't always know where to put it, but that didn't matter. I wanted them to try doing some, some data modeling. In part, I could have wished that they did this themselves in their own home cooked XML because that's so much easier, but part of the challenge is learning to work with the controlled vocabulary in order to share your work with others. So um, I had two weeks to do this because I have to teach my students XPath and XSLT. They transform their own work. They have semester projects to build. My in orientation to the to, for them, TEI is going to be a choice. I had two weeks. So at one point, I put my project director hat on and said, all right, I'm going to make this easier for everybody. I'm going to make you an ODD. I made them an odd. I came up with a controlled vocabulary that represented what I thought were their best, um, their best ideas for encoding the survey. I added a little bit of transcription of my own. In no way did they did the whole class finish coding the survey, but they actually got about halfway there. They they did pretty well. Um, I handed this back to them, showed them what an ODD was, showed them what a schema was. They had written their own schemas, so they understood how to associate the schema. And then they started making real progress. Um, so this is some of the code we came up with. You'll recognize our friend AB, the anonymous block, which is one of the coolest elements ever. And we used the add element here, which comes from manuscript markup. And this is something that came from our class odd customization. I have now now, could we finish it? I tossed it out as one of six options for my students to try to complete by December. And I've got a couple of students who chose it. Um, not everybody's going to love the TEI. I think the rest of them are going to do projects from their own home cooked XML. But that's okay, because where we're going next is for them to learn how to write XSLT to transform them, transform their code. And we'll see how far they get by December. And here's more about that's the the project. This is more about me and my courses. If you need to learn about XML technologies, I'm someone who does a lot of teaching. So look for me to be teaching at the DHSI when we ever do that again. I also run a coding school associated with my digital Mitford project. So hope to talk to some of you some more later. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. We're going to move ahead to um, Serenity Sutherland. Um, at SUNY Oswego, who's going to talk about double pedagogy, graduate students teaching TEI to undergrads in the Seward project. Hi, everyone. Um, um, so the Seward project uh, is a project that I was on at the University of Rochester as a graduate student. I'm no longer a graduate student, but it's one of the, um, the richest projects I've ever worked on that has undergraduate encoding. And so that's why I wanted to talk about it today. Um, I consider that myself like some kind of um, honorary project member, I guess. Um, so our, our main goals uh, on the project are to um, obviously transcribe all the letters, um, annotate the letters, edit them to the uh, best that they can be according to the actual uh, primary documentation and the subject knowledge, uh, encode them in TEI, and then um, we built the website as well uh, during the time that I was there. And so the website is up and running uh, now with a bunch of beautiful letters um, for you to look at. Um, this is very much a collaborative project. I love um, that Laura told us a little bit about what it's like to drop into a class or drop into a project and try and teach people about TEI um, because that's very much what graduate students and librarians did on the Seward project is they kind of just popped in and um, tried to teach the students in you know um, a class session or two uh, how to encode. Um, we did the same for uh, transcription and annotation as well. The way that the class worked is um, it would be built around, um, actually, let me just go ahead to that slide. 
it would uh, be built around a topic. So the topic might be William Henry's, um, it might be uh, William Henry Seward's um, political life, it might be the Seward family civil war, it might be women's lives and letters. Um, so there, there's different topics that the class would run through each year. Uh, the classes run, I think, about eight years now. And the goal really is to take the students' work that they do in class and incorporate it into the website. So um, whatever they produce, we want to show it to the public. So we have to have very high standards for what the students are producing. And um, this is where it becomes highly collaborative because then graduate students can come in and uh, serve as editors, serve as teachers, serve as mentors. And I want to touch on something that Lisa said in the beginning uh, at, in her first presentation, uh, which is the, the issue of student labor. And for this particular pro project, the students are being um, if they're graduate students, they're being paid. If they're undergraduate students who are acting as mentors, they're possibly being paid on the project or they're getting credit in some way, um, either through the course or through an independent study. Um, so I think that's really important for both graduate students and undergraduate students that there's this, this labor is somehow being, uh, is worth something to them. And I think it made, a, it made the students feel, um, a lot of the, the evaluative feedback that we get is that they felt, um, like they were part of something and contributing to the project. And they could go to the project and look through the letters and see, oh, look, I encoded this project. I transcribed this letter, I encoded this letter, and then they could show that to their family. And it felt like um, something that was really meaningful. In addition to the TEI, which I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about because we've already seen a lot of TEI, um, we also had some other student projects um, that worked with the material, um, worked with the content of the letters in interesting ways. Um, so it gets to that idea of pulling out what's useful in the letters for uh, research or teaching purposes. Um, one was we had a student who said, um, you know, it would be a lot easier for me to transcribe these letters if I knew what some of these words were. Um, as people have mentioned, the issue of cursive handwriting is a problem, but also a problem is 19th century obscure words, at least to college students who think that the words are obscure. Um, so, so she said, I don't know what some of these words are. Um, you know, ironically, what's obfuscate? I don't know what that means. And so she um, started a dictionary list um, and she called it Sioux words, um, uh, playing on the Sioux word. And so that became part of the markup um, where we would mark up these Sioux words that she didn't recognize. This was totally out of our scope when we started the project. We didn't think that this would be part of what we wanted to do, but we decided to do it because it was. she was so passionate about it. She stayed with our project for the four years that she was in undergrad and she really shepherded it. And it became another way to think about the text that was kind of outside of the conventional way that we had all been trained in you know, various, um, you know, various di digital editing uh, settings. So, so we really like that. Um, so that's, I guess, one way of thinking about encoding differently. Um, and it came from student interest. Another um, example is um, students were really interested in the material culture surrounding this archive. The archive is vast, there's tons of manuscript material, but there's also a lot of materials that are referenced in the letters that show up either in the Seward House Museum uh, located in Auburn, New York, or show up in the archive at the University of Rochester Rare Books and Special Collections. One of the pieces of material archive is the scrapbooks, which are both their books, so they're textual, but they also contain these really interesting material objects, pieces of hair, um, lockets, um, things that are just really fascinating and combined with the book in this very interesting way. So how do we manage that in, um, in TEI or in encoding uh, settings. And so um, that was one project that was really fascinating. Um, we had family tree software, of course, people have already talked about that. Um, we also had, I think someone said they love maps. That might've been, Elisa, I can't remember, but we did have some um, maps come into play in um, what the students did. Um, we had a, a student who did a, a GIS mapping of the um, calls that 
uh, Frances Stewart, who's William Henry Stewart's wife, um, that she received in Auburn, um, and also the calls that she made um, to other people. She kept a, a, a list of them for a year. And so they mapped that in GIS and actually found out something really interesting that a lot of the calls uh, that she made and that were made to her came from one side of the river. Um, and what we found when we overlaid this on the map is that the places that she avoided were located next to a prison in Auburn. And that place um, was kind of sprouting up and was kind of considered um, almost like, I guess, blue collar or um, certainly not genteel enough for the uh, for the stewards um, who you know were had this uh, great political standing and so um, that was interesting and no one had, had ever really talked about that before in relation to the stewards so I think my 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 point here is that the students are doing really valuable work that's contributing to an ongoing project. And at the same time, they are contributing new ways of understanding um, how we think about the text uh, through something like Seward's, but also how we think about the content itself, work that scholars and historians do, the students are helping us to do through these kinds of encoding and markup tools. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to focus on here uh, to talk about with everyone is the um, very useful guidelines that can be found on the Seward Project website. Um, and I'm hoping that I can pull them up. Um, yeah, so this is the, um, the link that I showed you. Um, we'll take you to a project standards and guidelines page on the Seward Project site. And here, this is for folks who might be starting out um, with their own project or just interested in pedagogy. We have our transcription and annotation guidelines that we give to students. These are meant to be very brief and they are meant to be um, manageable that students can sit down and understand in a short amount of time, like a period of a week so that they can master it and then contribute to the project. Um, so that might be useful to uh, you folks if you're thinking of um, teaching in, in um, a classroom setting. And then I also wanted to point you to our TEI guidelines, um, which are very specific, of course, to our own project. But um, maybe this would be useful to you if you're even wanting to learn TEI a little bit more or Helen, I'm thinking of you and your students in your classes, you're trying to um, do this for the first time, hopefully this could be useful to you. So those are some of the um, tools uh, that, that um, I was hoping um, if anyone has any comments or wants to talk about, um, we could talk about in the in the discussion session. But um, thank you for listening, and um, hopefully, I didn't go over too much. Um, our last presenter is Robin Sullivan, University at Buffalo. Uh, Robin's going to talk about a resource for finding digital pedagogy tools called M Tech Wiki, and I think about an associated online course, the M Tech MOOC. Thank you very much. Um, so this um, part of today's presentation is going to be quite a bit different than the previous sessions. And I was really blown away by all of the, what you've shared in these projects. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is um, a, a SUNY sponsored project. It grew from another IITG grant. And um, hopefully this project will share resources with you and with all of your students that will help you do your work in digital humanities. Um, the full name of the project is called uh, the SUNY Exploring Emerging Technologies for Lifelong Learning and Success. Um, but for short, um, we just call it MTech MOOC. And, um, the objective of this project is to allow learners, faculty, and students alike to explore and reflect on innovative and creative uses of all types of emerging technologies. Um, as uh, Paul mentioned, it is two parts. So one of the parts is a Coursera-based MOOC that kind of walks you through the process of exploring different um, uh, emerging technologies. And it's focused on the lifelong learning strategies and also the four C's of 21st century skills, communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. The part that I'm going to try to focus on is the MTech Wiki. This is a website that was um, uh, built to complement the MOOC. It is a database of emerging technology tools. 
It is crowdsourced, so you can, anybody in the world can go and add uh, tools that will assist somebody to enhance those 21st century skills. Um, it can be used totally as a standalone resource, or it can be used together with the MOOC. And um, this is a blown up screen of the search page on the wiki. And um, we have about 500 tools in there right now. Um, started with about 150, about two and a half years ago. When you get here from the MOOC, you're separated into the four modules that you see um, the center of the screen, lifelong learning, communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. If you go in, click on those, it kind of narrows down those 500 resources into tools that um, would help you meet those needs. And you can also then start to filter by objectives. So what are the objectives if you're in communication and collaboration? Do you want to um, create a professional identity or are you trying to share information? And then you can also filter by categories. The database in the back end here is also open source. So if anybody has creative ways to use or improve this code um, to make this searchable option better, I would love to talk with you. Um, um, just quickly, you can see the different types of categories um, that are in here. Um, so it goes, you know, quite in depth. It's a wiki, come to the page and hit contribute, create an account, add any tools that are not in there um, already. And feel free to also, you don't even need an account to rate the tools to say which ones are better and which ones are not. And then those that are good will float to the top. Um, I wanted to share um, just a bunch of the tools that are in here that might be relevant to the work that you are all doing. Um, creating websites, I'm certain, is uh, you know kind of a, a tangential part. And depending on the type of project that you're doing, um, you do want to share the the end results. So maybe through WordPress, um, Scalar. Um, there's also some uh, pages that are resources about W3C markup and validation. Um, if you are, you know, hoping to get students into some close reading, some all the, you know, 99% of the tools on the wiki are freely available online tools. They're not commercially available proprietary tools that you have to pay for, but they're all free, but then there is a premium. So there is a kind of a, another level that you can get after the free version. Um, hypothesis and perusal are great for um, collaborative editing. And if you haven't played with them, um, you might wanna see what kind of ideas you can get. Um, project management, you are all involved in you know, dot, a lot of different parts. So Slack and Trello are options um, and um, you know just concept mapping kind of trying to you know visualize some of these layers of of the coding that you're all doing um, is something that's useful I since I kind of uh, am out on the outskirts of digital humanities but I wanted to share this information with you I'm going to keep my session very short um, I'll show you just one of the records so you can see what the wiki pages actually look like. Of course, I picked the one that's not the best one to choose. <laughs> um, and so this is just um, one of the pages that shows you the name of the tool, um, the ratings, and how it can be upvoted, how many times it's been viewed. If you're logged in, you can edit and improve the page, correct a typo. Um, and resources. So that's all I am going to share. I'm going to save time for all of you to um, communicate about the, the great projects you've been working on. So thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Robin. Um, uh, I think one thing we saw from um, many of the presentations is that in addition to doing the work of encoding texts, um, many of these projects need a way for that work to be shared. And in some cases for students to share the experience that they've had doing the work. So tools like uh, WordPress and Scalar um, uh, seem like they're enormously important for this kind of work.
Thanks for thanks for sharing that, and and thank you again to all our presenters for really um, mind blowing <laughs> presentations. I would say that are incredible uh, testimony to the to the work that you are all doing, and also testimony to what undergraduate students can do if we if we give them the confidence to do it, and we express confidence in their ability to do it. Um, so really wonderful stuff. We have some time left over. We've got about 15 minutes, fortunately, for some discussion. And I would just like to, uh, to open it up for people to um, unmute and ask questions of uh, specific presenters about their presentations or uh, weigh in with some, some comments. Well, <clears throat> I'd be curious about how do you get over the kind of wall of code reaction? Because because that because I think that happens a lot, uh, where it's just like, oh, this is really confusing to start with. And then how do you how do you get that engagement in the actual encoding? For me, on day one, I give them a tiny five line text that is a recipe for slime. And I ask them and I show them their first XML to write that in a root read element and do something that separates it out in an order. And because it's a ball of slime, we have this kind of fun tactile metaphor that this is both real and, you know, that you could imagine setting, you know, putting order to a little bit of chaos. And you just sort of start small and then it starts to feel more like crochet work or knitting or te something textile, you, you have that textile to text metaphor. I do like not starting with the TEI, however. And I think if they make their own code out of their own working parts and then you show them what elements and attributes are, I think that's probably better than throwing them in the deep end of the pool with the TEI guidelines because it isn't all just about learning rules. It is about um, learning how to structure something. It becomes more like writing an outline then I think so. Um, just quickly um, at RIT, hi Kirk. Um, <laughs> I think you said we have geeky students. Um, and so our students actually come to us having taken classes in code um, and that can be a problem because you have to move them from CSS back to XML. And you have students who, you know, want to write a Python script for a table and TEI. And yeah. So it is an inter it's interesting to try to grab them when they're sort of in that, this malleable stage where, where they're thinking about code and how to think about text and code, but also not um, sort of bound by really super strict CS rules. And I think that's the bridging point. So in my intro to programming, my first assignment is actually write a recipe for how to create a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And uh -huh. you know, that's the famous, uh, you know, camp one and follow the instructions exactly. And I figure that's a level set because even the programmers and the mathematicians, it's all about the language and getting the structure. And the interesting thing is the CS people have the formal mathematical structures and all that, but not the expression per se. And the humanists are inverted in that. They have the expression, but not the formalism. And it's a very weird bridge that I'm still trying to find that, that mesh because the interesting thing is working with Paul and, and some of our students, um, it's like, oh, you know what? I stayed so far. I was a math computer science geek. So no, I never went over to visit Paul over at his office when I was a student. Um, but now it's like, well, yes, critical analysis and, and the, the formalism that is found in humanism or in humanist research, it's there. It's just in a different form. And that's where Paul and I have always been discussing the taxonomies, how people say things, you know, and that sharing and that common language that was said all about, you know, in many projects is you've got to come to the common understanding and the common statement and like with uh, Lisa, the TEI, 
you're dumping so far into it. You got to start back a little bit. And I think that's one of those interesting challenges that still is an open, open question for me. It's really sad though, when your students are teaching you TI, just by the way. That's great though, when that happens, right? That's Lisa, I, I don't know. <laughs> this sort of makes me feel like totally unqualified to be doing what I'm doing. Well, but that's, but that's where I saw working with Paul, it was one of those that when we put the students in the middle, they learn from all kinds of different things and they become experts in the hybrid. And so to that, as long as we're the lifelong students who are always learning also and open to those things, the technology is moving way too fast. And it's like, when I heard a student say, wait a minute, this is moving too fast. That's like, there's no hope I'm ever gonna be able to keep up with this. So it's always that collaboration. And I think that's what's also extremely interesting in this area is, okay, let everybody be their own expert, but come together, share the language, share the projects, exciting times. Randy, I was really interested in seeing what you're doing with family trees and the maps and the sort of the material, all of the context around the object. We are starting to go there. We've, we've been going there, but we've been so sort of in book history mode. Now we're reaching out to, okay, there's, a network of people, who was the grandfather, who's the son, who like who's where. And, and so we're having, you know, what street was this on in Sheffield? You, so I was curious about how are you using all of that? Uh, so I should also say that, you know, the project has been going on since about 2013, 2014. Um, so it has a huge, I mean, that's kind of, that's a really long time. And every year they do a class associated with it. And in that class, the students come up with their final project. They propose something like a sewers or a map or, or transcribing a recipe book. Some of those projects are so excellent that then we say to those students, oh, would you like to come work for us and develop this project more? And so then they can transition out of taking the class for credit and actually working on that project. And then a lot of those projects um, may get placed online um, in the stewardproject.org website. Um, and they may be interactive in certain ways or they may just be like a feature like, hey, this student did this cool thing, just kind of depending on um, you know, what kind of project it is. Um, so yeah, so it's a, I think it's, you know, it sounds like exactly like you're on the same path that we were because when we first started out, it was like the students were sitting around at a table being like, okay, what's even interesting in all of these documents? And they decided that it's the family that's interesting. That's why it's the Seward Family Archive and not the William Henry Seward Archive because there's relationships between mothers and sons and all this kind of stuff, mothers and daughters, that's the interesting thing to the students. So that was way back when, of course, when there was no <laughs> map or anything. And then, you know, all these many years later, they've been able to come up with this stuff. Um, and yeah, so it's being housed on the website in certain locations. So um, definitely, I hope that answers your question if you want to browse around there. Yeah, thanks. Um, we are we are using purse name and org name because lot, we're having some Interesting. Um, so Thomas Firth and Sons is clearly an organization, but Thomas Firth is a person. So then you have the nesting. Um, so we're having all kinds of fun with um, purse name, org names. Um, and then, you know, we have an index. And so the index will list a name and then you go and try to find, you're lucky if it's actually on that page or close. And what'll ha be happen is, is like, it looks like two different names because the handwriting is, is, you know, and so then you have to sort of try and figure it out. And then we go back to Sheffield, UK and we start looking in the archives of the newspapers and we find the name and like, we jump for joy and we're like, okay, that took an hour. Like, really, is that what we want to be doing? And so trying to figure out whether this, whether that network, like, obviously it is important and it probably was worth the hour, but it, it's hard to try to try to figure that out. But, you know, we have students, and I think what is really has been just great for me is that they, most of, because our students are digital humanities and because many of them are coming from CS, honestly, from coding, 
they get in here and they think they're going to be like doing rope coding and suddenly they're like you know spending an hour in the archives of Sheffield UK trying to figure out you know is this Parson which would be a title or is this a name personium <laughs> so anyway I think that's you know just having them look at people suddenly becomes not only a, a, a like way long encoding device but also an incredible historical research endeavor yeah i mean you can spend a whole you could spend a whole semester just developing a list of people and places i, I was typing in the chat when you mentioned an index do you mean you have you're keeping a list of controlled identifiers like list person with the person elements and we are yeah. doing, we're doing that in the encoding and then we're keeping a separate thing the index is actually the index of the manuscript so yeah i'm sorry i use index I call it a site index on my project, but it, it has like, it's a list of of all these person elements and then it has alternative purse names for each one. And it gets really rough with 19th century women who have like five different names and you know, who, who are they? Yeah, um, but yeah, that's like a big portion of some of my projects. And it is, it's, it's possible to just take a whole semester of sending students to authoritative research databases to go hunt up information and write something um, for the <laughs> like the list of the contact list right the, the people. and our worst nightmare is terms for book binding so you know forwarding is the least of our problems <laughs> it's like binding all the different kinds of inks all the different kinds of paper all the different kinds of tape you had no idea how many different kinds of glue there are <laughs> Well, and dealing with people, I've worked on two projects with Geneseo historians. One was um, black politicians after the Civil War, and the other one is a list of uh, medieval nuns of a, of a particular order. And yeah, that is horrible stuff for databases, um, of which I still need to formulate that and work with some humanists to, to define some requirements because like late 12th century, <laughs> it's like, mm. <laughs> and it, in archive, uh, Helen and, and some of her team have, have educated us. We don't talk about the dark ages. No, you come back with a bloody stump. Um, but those are interesting fuzzy searches and the ambiguity, computer science can fix some of that, but the challenge is, is the humanists in, infer that and, and gather that by experience. And so it's almost a machine learning kind of thing. Can we start developing some models that will help navigate, you know, is Parson a, a title or a name or, you know, all those things. And that's where I find it interesting of like, Oh yeah, there's some really rich stuff of sorting out names and dates and, you know, well, born in 1842 or 1856, but it's a person, they know, it, but it's the, well, we're not sure yet. And then there's that, how do you tag that? How do you encode that? And that's where it gets very interesting because humanists do that that's you know a thing but then how do you expand it how do you then quantify it which then turns into the messy stuff but i think that's very fertile ground of some very interesting work to be done yeah i i wrestle with whether my students need the tei because i don't know that they do in 15 week class i'm not really sure but where they need it is if they're going to contribute to a grant funded project in which we have to participate in the controlled vocabulary, right? And, and that has, but do they need it? I don't know. I'd rather they had the thinking process of doing the structuring and transforming and writing their own rules. And that's the part I like is you get to write your own rules. Um, well, and I think that's where at the end you can say, okay, here's, here's a big one. This is the real, real world version and I think once they've built up their own space, then you can bring in the industrial grade production line. Oh, poof. Level two, the TEI, yeah. yeah you know, the, 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 the one last thing, you know, oh, and this is how the onion grows another layer of skin. Yeah. Um, 
And that might be one of those ending things of now you know the basics. That's when when I was doing math, it's like I heard this one thing. It's like, oh my God, there's so much more. And I think for at least for the Python programming that I teach, I try to get them at least the basic structures. Once they have the structures, then you can you can layer on that. You can scaffold that. But getting what's an if statement, what's a, you know what's a loop, and those kinds of things. And once you get those basic structures, then okay, that's how that one works. Then it's dialects. I think, I think um, Caroline's been trying to get in here for a bit. She's got a, a hand up. Uh, these are all amazing um, presentations, and uh, I was thinking about uh, going back to Helen's comment, like the student thinking, I thought we were going to be reading text. And there's all this wonderful stuff. You have these physical objects. Um, and with the, like, uh, with Lisa's, I remember in the accounting book seeing that no overtime allowed. And so I'm interested in the, the storytelling and the interpretation or with Elisa with that amazing form, right? With Cooper like spilling over. And, um, you know, I'm really curious to know what she had to say about Oberlin. So I'm just wondering if you embed into your assignment, something where you're asking them, um, uh, not like with the coding to also um, have the interpreting or, or um, make things the storytelling, like if there's a way to bridge that gap, that problem that Helen was talking about, um, where they're not just thinking about text in new ways as material objects, but that they're making that leap um, because as someone who loves textual recovery, I know how you can go down the rabbit hole and just be discovering all this information, but then you've got to make something out of it. So I'm wondering how you build that into assignments because you have such wonderful objects to work with. And I wonder if you have any tricks for making that leap to where they, they do see that they're getting new meaning out of the text. So this is not a trick but it is also something I'm deeply anxious about because it is my month of November, which is I think it's vital that students learn how to transform their markup into something that they can share on the web. And that is why I am committed to teaching XSLT, which means they can take the document data they've modeled in XML or TEI and write code that transforms it into HTML. But that's what they transform is filtering. They have to make decisions they have to choose what to prioritize. Are you going to highlight, like what you, um, I think Serenity, you were working with Citation, which also you do that work with CSS, um, but you have to make, your students have to make decisions about what they want to highlight and call attention to. They have to have an agenda and they have to be, what they present is going to tell some sort of story. So for me, this is about their, their semester project is going to be make, a, make an edition of this and do something that explores a research question with the object that you chose. I tried to choose something that was reasonably short. The AJC survey, you know, if they don't finish it, I'm going to pitch in and help them out a little bit, but they're going to be the ones in charge of telling the story. Um, and I gave them a bottled research question, is, which was, can you come up with a, a metric that counts the number of lines by which she exceeds what they give you on the form because you can do that with XML. You're <laughs> like, you know, how many, yeah. Um, if you got the markup in there that has the line beginnings, you're like, all right, she's 44 lines, they gave her four. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, as Serenity pointed out, it, it, uh, Laura's the one who's using citation and um, Sorry about that. no, 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 that's it. Cause it, it's a great segue to a question that I wanted to ask uh, Laura, about um, about these modules in general, because because you showed us the TEI one, but that that's one of a number of of modules. And I'm wondering what kinds of general principles are being followed in creating these these modules for students. You know, given given some of the things that we've been saying about the sorts of challenges you can expect. Uh, in teaching this material to students, um, including uh, but but not limited to the 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 feeling that some students may have that wait a second this isn't this isn't what I thought an English class is supposed to do a literature class history class humanities class um, th this isn't what I bargained for so can you can you can you share with us at all about uh, the kind of um, the framework the thinking the general principles that you're that you're using in the modules. 
Yeah, um, so the larger digital integration teaching initiative. Um, so the modules are, we call them modules because um, it's often that we get um, professors um, across the departments who are interested in similar skills. And so when we create modules, it's like, um, we're gonna create the presentation slides and maybe the data set or um, the materials that we can then um, customize for the particular course and the particular faculty member we're working with. And so when it comes to um, creating the modules, like um, as the DI DITI is, has kind of come along, because it's only, I think, two or three years old now, um, it's really working in partnership with a faculty member to A, get to know, know the questions, like basic questions. How big is your class? Like, what um, kinds of readings are you doing? What kinds of work are you doing? How are you fitting in uh, these digital skills within your syllabus? Um, we have a, a very kind of consultation approach in which we have several meetings before we come into the class. Um, uh, we actually do like a call for partnerships at the beginning of the semester where they fill out a form, um, but it's very much like uh, we we work with the faculty member to try and troubleshoot as much as we can in terms of um, you know what kinds of questions students are going to have both about like you know how do you use it from a very basic I don't want to say basic but from the beginning like how do you have to download so we we have uh, handouts we you know we we have the materials we try and present and um, give to the instructors before we even step into the classroom so that they can like send to students. Um, but when I think the kind of modular thing, so our university uh, has been really kind of geared towards digital skills and digital um, literacy. Uh, and so the DITI was kind of created to, you know, try to make that easier. And one of the things that we've found is that we have faculty who um, not only are they learning for their students, both, you know, these new technologies, because, you know, they might be interested in text analysis or in Vivo or how to use WordPress for a site. Um, but then they, they are also learning those skills for their own research. Um, and so I think what's really interesting about the modules and how we've kind of adapted it is that, you know, there are professors who we are working with like every semester in kind of different iterations and refining these modules as we do them more and more. Um, but it's also really cool because there are also, you know, faculty members who are like, oh, well, I'm gonna integrate this both into my work and then in the future and, you know, might come back to us with some questions. Um, yeah, so the module is both like stuff that we can pick up and customize um, for different classrooms, but then also I would say, it, it is really geared around um, assignments, right? So we're trying not to have it just be like a one and done presentation, but like give the students prompts and materials that the that we are working with a professor to develop so that it's integrated into their their syllabus. So didn't mean to, <laughs> to just kind of go on a rant there, uh, but I hope I answered. Yeah, no, that's great. That's 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 really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have I have one other question, I think um, Helen, and it looks like your camera's off, so I'm, I'm hoping you're still, you're, and you're muted, so I'm hoping you're still here and able to hear the question, but um, uh, you you spoke about um, the problem of digital plagiarism. It was your, right? Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering if you have any more thoughts about that and, and, and whether other other folks um, in the meeting have, have uh, this, this had never occurred to me, I have to say. Um, it's really interesting because it's such a human problem and we've been talking about you know, the human and the, and the machine in much of this. Um, it, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of that possibility. And uh, so I wonder if you, if you have any additional thoughts about it and, and if any others have, have encountered it and, and have any thoughts about potential solutions. Yeah, I mean, the thing that really struck me is that after having met with almost all of the students who I'd been like, okay, you're in a gray area or you're a little bit on the wrong side of a gray area, which happened. Um, the thing that really struck me the most is that almost none of them had done it maliciously. 
And so like when you, anybody who's taught like freshman writing or has taught like a survey course at a perhaps a big state school or something, you are familiar with the students that go, oh, uh, well, you know, I get one free plagiarism and you're like, oh, okay. But this was not that. This was radically not that. This was students who seemed to be encountering um, a new, like hadn't realized that what they had done had crossed the line. And so one of the things that really struck me about this was that, you know, we're teaching them new technologies, we're teaching them new approaches, but there's also new problems here that none of us had thought through before, you know, or at least I hadn't, I don't want to speak for anyone else. And so um, there seemed to be, it was a really interesting thing and in that students were teaching it as truly a new object. And that with that new object or that new approach, there were new problems. And so I'm now working with the library here. Um, I'm very lucky in that the English librarian at UCCS is also new and um, has had some training in the digital humanities. So he's working with me to come up with a new, um, a new digital plagiarism workshop, which is the thing that like we had never, uh, we hadn't predicted we would need. And so that's been a learning experience but it's kind of cool to um, step back from just this specific module or the specific unit and to think about how that may manifest in other ways as well. And to really start to think about it as an act of creation versus an act of modeling and where you draw that line. There was a really interesting article I'd read a few years back about um, a digital humanities scholar who'd had his students work on recombination by purposefully copying different digital objects and putting them together. And so um, trying to figure out where the gray line in all of that is really kind of interesting and really kind of um, a fun new uh, wilderness for me, for lack of a better term. And from a programming point of view, there are a number of things where there are the snippets that these are the examples like TEI by example or whatever and I start off my course like I say you can find every every assignment that I have here on Google I guarantee that I guarantee it because that's where I found them but no um, but the thing that I ask them and the thing I challenge them with is try to do it yourself first the other thing I challenge them is if you're really good, you can figure out another way to do it. And so these might be ways of, because sometimes, especially in coding, almost all of my initial learning was copying and learning the structure and learning the, the mental process. And so the question is when you're recombining that is an artful thing. It's not like creating the paints and the inks and, you know, so are, you know, we are plagiarizing at certain points. So the question I guess could be, or may need to be reframed a little bit is at what point is it the laziness or whatever? Um, and what is the acceptable space? Because there's different, like in writing plagiarism, there's you know, almost a copy where you're just stealing the idea. But in this case, you're stealing the mechanics to represent something. So you know, like learning how to do cursive, well, everybody's doing the exact same thing. And that might be the differential that might be need, needed to navigate. And the interesting part is computer science has been also dealing with this so they have a little bit of a long runway that you might be able to replicate and use as a thing. But then also, what is the purpose? Because the other thing I look at when I code is if you've copied it and now understand that theory, now you've got it to use for the next one. And so I think maybe some of the framing might be, can you explain how this works and challenge them backwards, right? is you can use it, but how did you get there? Um, like David posted is the copying and pasting stack flow. I mean, most of my work now is all of that, of 
re, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, especially with this now, is we are, you know, stacking on top and now the creation, the, the creativity, the, the expression doesn't need to be fully flowed down, I think. So, and this is where that, this is that, well, very interesting questions of where it's the digital and the humanities. How do we navigate some of these things? So I invite you to maybe talk with your computer science faculty of how do they deal with it? Because like certain algorithms, that's it. But there are the elegant or the, um, the novel approaches. And so whenever I see students like copying and pasting, it's like, before you actually submit it, understand, work through it backwards, you know, learn, learn from it, use it as a learning opportunity. And maybe that's a, a framing. And I don't know in your cases if that's the case or not, um, but that might be one way to, to navigate some of that. Cause yeah, it's like, yeah, uh, go, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, it's really interesting because actually this is why I decided that the plagiarism was not malicious, was because I had kind of asked them to explain what was going on. And some of them had really interesting things. <laughs> a lot of them just said, it looked important. And I was like, well, yes, but that's not quite cutting it. And, um, but the thing that had tipped me off in the first place is that they, some of them weren't able to explain what it was doing. And so I think, I think that's really the interesting thing is that at that point I asked them to just do it without the things they thought looked important, but the things they actually knew what was what it was doing. And they could again look at those same models, but the um, the tags that had to do more with rendering because we hadn't looked at XSLT or any kind of like next steps. And so I was like, this is sort of out of place here because I had just asked you to look at structure or description and this is not that. Um, but yeah, I think that computer science is a really interesting module and a really interesting model. And I think that um, the interesting thing about developing this new plagiarism course is that it can look at how these things are handled in two dramatically different fields, which I'm excited about. Well, and that's where I also say cite it. If you're going to use it, you know, cite it, because that's the thing is at least cre create the artifacts that got you to this place. Because if you're rendering, it's like, okay, why, why am I doing this? Is I think that the bigger question, because at least at least most programming things, the how is the hard part. Yeah. Or, you know, and the easy part is you can always find a copy of code that will, you know, sum of num set of numbers. And then there are really cool ways of doing it that's the how and maybe some of that differentiation or challenging is like when you're skipping you know when you're answering the why without the challenge or not you know not working through the how to get to the why so so um david birnbaum has his hand up and i think we're we're um we're at about 8 45 so i'm going to give david the uh the last word here, whether it's a, <laughs> unless it's a question that someone needs to answer, then they'll have the last word, but we'll make this the last round and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up for tonight. Go ahead, David. Well, I'll, I'll try to contribute to the symmetry, having been the first speaker at these, um, <laughs> at these conferences, I'll try to say something useful at the end. I have a different perspective on uh, plagiarism than what uh, many of you have noted. Um, uh, Kirk said in in the chat and then in the discussion that when you copy a code snippet, you need to attribute it, and that that is absolutely the case. Uh, but as as long as you were doing that, I want my students to to look stuff up, and I sometimes tell them. Indeed, I often tell them that learning to code uh, is learning how to look stuff up. They think that I, I know everything that there is to know about writing XSLT and I will tell them and then they will know. And I give them homework assignments that challenge them to do things they don't know how to do. And they get frustrated and they say, you haven't taught us this. And I say, that's kind of the point. How do you think I learned it? And I'm, I'm not always going to be around to answer their questions. So if, if they want to become uh, their own practitioners, 
they have to learn how to look things up. And uh, the languages I work with, XSLT and XQuery, are a declarative and functional. That's not a natural way for people who haven't been trained to think. And I, I can tell when uh, somebody's figured out their own way to do something in XSLT because they use for loops. That's, that's not how you write XSLT idiomatically. And what I want them to do is, is look up how to work with the language idiomatically. And I certainly want them to be able to explain it to me, but I, I, they're, they're going to learn from seeing how people with more experience have done it. So I don't think of this as plagiarism at all. I think of the, the natural workflow is I have to do something I don't know how to do, and I have to make things happen in my code, and I don't know how to make them happen. And But somebody else has probably done something like this, and I want to figure it out. So I want to go see what they've done. And uh, if, if it looks smart and idiomatic, I want to use it. And I want to include uh, the URL and a comment so that I'll, I'll be documenting where I got it from. I, I want to say one more thing, because that much was about coding. And I also want to talk about encoding, that is to say, markup. Uh, the fact that we are teaching students to do their markup in TEI means we're already teaching them to do stuff other people have figured out. We're not asking them to do document analysis, figure out the inherent structures, decide how to model it, write their own schema. I mean, we, you know, I know Elisa does this, I do this in my courses, but to the extent that we're training them to use TEI for good reason, what we're training them to do is uh, learn how to apply methods that other smart people have figured out and debugged to their own projects. So and we don't think of that as plagiarism, the idea that uh, you're, you're going to tag the highlighting in your text in a TEI idiomatic way isn't plagiarism. It's learning, uh, learning the conventions of how these technologies are applied. So uh, I, you know, I think the mantra of learning to code is learning how to look stuff up is going to take them far. Well, and then me. differentiating between a good answer and bad answer. That's another one which I find is you go Google, you find the first five answers and you go, yeah, no, that's not right. And, and it's interesting when students just cut and hack and beat on it, like, but did you think about what they were saying? You know, they may have been regurgitating or something and like to selectively copy and paste also is also a very interesting trick to learn. <laughs> In, I mean, they, they risk being like the, the, student, the student who's actually cheating, who's copying the wrong exam answer from the kid next to him in the, in the class. Uh, so the, the point of looking stuff up is learning how other people have done it, but you're supposed to engage with that critically. But if your instinct is to do something in a 10-line for, for loop and somebody's done it in a one-line declarative statement, you ought to be saying, wow, that's the XSLT idiomatic way to do this. And now I'm going to know next time. Exactly. Well, this was this. Um, thank you for symmetrically winding things up, David. It actually, it, I, on my screen, there's a perfect visual analog because everybody else is four across, three rows, and you're just at the bottom all by yourself, David. <laughs> the solo square in the bottom row. Um, this is a perfect way to end. Um, the fact that it's it's uh, ten to nine um, for a discussion that was billed as seven to eight thirty is really you know, and that so many folks are still here. I'm sure we could go on much longer, but uh, folks, I'm sure also have other obligations, things they need to do. Um, I look forward to more discussions. I know that uh, Serenity, Fiona, Nick, and I have talked about. Um, in the spring, doing some follow-up workshops in the registration form, we asked people what kinds of workshops they might be interested in. So uh, expect to hear more from us about some spring opportunities to get together. It's wonderful to be part of, of uh, a community like this, people um, willing to, to share generously the work that they are, are doing and um, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am. So look forward to more conversations. Uh, special kudos again to David Birnbaum for um, delivering the keynote and wrapping things up at the end. 
And uh, but thank, thanks, thanks again so much to everybody.